Hello, welcome to Timmy Matt Law. I'm Mr. McClellan, and for this video, we're going to look at the offence of assault. Um, this is going to be the first offence that we've covered, and therefore it's really important to remember our concepts of law, which we've already learned. These concepts of law essentially form the foundations of any offence and defence, so you should always look out for them. They may be relevant in a scenario, they may not be relevant, but equally they should always be in your mind, and therefore they'll help you to determine whether the offence has actually been committed or not. Just to run through the concepts of law, just as a reminder, we have the actus reus, the physical element of a crime, three different types, an act, an omission, or a state of affairs. We have omissions themselves, that's a failure to act. The normal rule for an omission, of course, is that it doesn't lead to criminal liability, but it can do where there is a duty to act. We then have causation. Effectively, does a particular event lead to a particular consequence? Then we have the mens rea, the mental element of an offence. Don't forget your hierarchy of mens rea, intention at the top, going on down to recklessness. And then we have transferred manus, where the mens rea is transferred from the intended victim to the actual victim. And then it's the contemporaneity rule, that coincidence or coincidence between the actus reus and the mens rea. In simple terms, they have to be present both at the same time in simple terms. So don't forget those concepts of law. They're really, really important. Do look out for them whenever you get a scenario. Now, when it comes to an assault, what we're looking at here in very, very simple terms is that an assault is caused if you cause someone to fear. I do have a problem with that word, but we'll come back to that in a second. But if you cause someone to fear immediate and personal violence, okay? So if I go up to someone, raise a fist, and they're scared, then I'll have committed an assault against them. It doesn't mean that you beat them up, black or blue. I think that's the common reference that we have in society. If you've assaulted someone, it is, legally speaking, just where you have scared someone to the extent that they fear personal violence will be committed against them. Do be careful of that word fear. I will come back to that in just a second. Now, just a few bits and bobs, the basics about assault. Often you get assault and battery happening roughly at the same time. Normally an assault happens first, so you cause someone to fear personal violence against them, and then you actually make physical contact with them. So you raise your fist, and then you hit someone. The assault is going to be the raising of the fist, and then obviously you make the physical contact, and there is the battery. They're often coupled together to form common assault. They are separate offences though, and you should treat them as separate offences, but you will often read them as common assault, as if they're wrapped up together, probably because they happen at the same time, or roughly an assault followed by a quick battery. Now, the reason why it's called common assault is because they are case law offences. They're common law offences. They've been developed through precedent. There is no statute which defines what an assault, or indeed a battery, is. The closest thing that we have is the Criminal Justice Act 1988, and it's section 39 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988. It is important that you remember that year, 1988, because there are several Criminal Justice Acts, so you've got to get the right one, 1988, section 39. And the key term that you need to couple with the identification of that statute is recognised. Now, as we learn more and more offences, you will start to say as a matter of routine, if you like, um, such and such an offence comes under such and such a statute. We don't say that assault or indeed battery comes under, we say that it's recognised in section 39 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988 because this statute talks about the sentencing for assault and battery but it doesn't define the offence itself. The offence of assault is actually defined in the case of Fagan which I've got written down here 1969, you'll all remember the case of Fagan, I'm sure. That is where the Irish defendant drove upon the police officer's foot and refused to move it at the police officer's request. We saw that case when we looked at the contemporaneity rule, but it also gave that definition of what an assault is. So the definition itself, the defendant intentionally or recklessly causes the victim to apprehend immediate and unlawful personal violence. It is a summary offence, it's not particularly serious, and that means it will be heard in the magistrate's court. The maximum sentence though, and I guess this is serious, if you're given this maximum sentence, six months in prison, six months custodial sentence, or 
and a £5,000 fine, okay? But in ordinary terms, it's not the most serious offences. There are plenty of offences that are way more serious, and I'm sure your common sense will lead you to that conclusion. Nevertheless, the definition is something that you should remember. The best students that I teach do remember this definition, so I'm going to say it several times. The more times you say it, the more likely you are to remember it. So an assault is where the defendant intentionally or recklessly causes the victim to apprehend immediate and unlawful personal violence. I'll say it one more time. An assault is where the defendant intentionally or recklessly causes the victim to apprehend immediate and unlawful personal violence. And as any, or as with any, uh, definition for any offence or indeed a defence, individual words matter. So this is why I've underlined certain words or indeed certain phrases, because we're going to unpick these to know how this offence actually works in practice. And it has been developed, as it so often is, through case law. So we're going to look at lots of case law examples in order to define and unpick, make clear, analyse what these key terms actually mean in practice. So the first key term that we've got is causes. I could start off with intention or recklessly, but I won't because they're the mens rea elements. We always do the actus reus elements first in terms of offence analysis, and therefore the mens rea elements are going to come last, as you can see at the bottom. So let's start off with the first actus reus element, causes. And obviously that speaks of causation, so that's got to be in your mind. It has a particular event caused a particular consequence. Here, though, with an assault, it must be caused by an act, not an omission, unless, and you know this already, there is a duty to act. And the case which essentially underpinned that was the case of Santa Bermudez in 2003. So in ordinary terms, most commonly, an assault will be caused by an act, the raising of a fist, uh, it could be the raising of a leg, going to kick someone. Uh, I did raise my leg there, you can't see it, but I promise you I did. Fairly basic, fairly straightforward, a physical action, and you cause someone to be a little bit scared, in other words. But it can be an omission where there is a duty to act. Case of Santa Bermudez, the defendant was being searched by a female police officer. Now, the female police officer did the right thing in the situation that the police officer found themselves in and asked the defendant, did they have any sharp objects on them? Obviously, they were being searched for weapons or indeed illegal drugs. And the defendant replied that they didn't have anything sharp on them. And the female police officer carried out the search. She then pricked her finger on a hypodermic needle, which is obviously quite a scary thing to happen to someone. And therefore, because of that failure to tell the police officer that the defendant had on their person a sharp hypodermic needle, there was a duty for the defendant to act. He should have told the police officer that indeed there was that needle within their clothing. Um, and indeed, if we look at our omissions, our case examples which underpin where there is a duty to act, that speaks of the case of Miller. There is a duty to act where the defendant has set in motion a chain of events, or more particularly, created a dangerous situation. And that's what Santa Bermudez had done. They'd created a dangerous situation by having the hypodermic needle on them person, and indeed not telling the police officer about it. And it was on that basis that they were found liable for an assault. Equally, moving on, words can constitute an assault. It doesn't just have to be a physical action, it can be just mere words. And indeed, words, I call them mere words, but words, of course, can be quite powerful. And a good example of this is the case of Constanza in 1997. So in that case, the defendant was a stalker and had actually written 800 letters over a period of several months to the victim. They'd also taken items from the victim's washing line and daubed writing on their front door. So it was really quite scary and weird stuff for the victim to have to go through. No physical act necessarily directed from the defendant to the victim. It was mere words. But words, as I've just said, have to be taken seriously. And on that basis, the defendant was found liable. Constanza was found liable for the assault of the victim because the victim apprehended immediate and unlawful force against them by the defendant. 
Moving on, and more interestingly perhaps, more uniquely perhaps, silence can constitute an assault. So it doesn't even have to be words which cause someone to be a little bit scared of another person. It can be just mere silence. Case examples here, again stalking cases, Island and Burstow. Interestingly, Burstow, Island and indeed Constanza all happened in 1997. I don't know what it was about that particular year when it comes to stalking cases and setting new precedents, but there you go. And in those two cases, Island and Burstow, it was silent phone calls which the defendants were engaged in against the victims and it was the heavy breathing, no word spoken, which caused the victims to fear immediate and unlawful personal violence against themselves, okay? So it doesn't even have to be an act, it doesn't have to be words even, it can just be silence, which causes someone to be a little bit scared for their safety. Moving on to the next key word, we've got this word apprehend. Now, I'm going to take issue with the word that I've uttered a few times, the word fear, or indeed I've said sometimes being scared. The victim doesn't actually have to fear immediate unlawful personal violence against them, or indeed be scared. They just have to anticipate it, to expect it. That's what the word apprehend means. And there's a really good logical reason for this. As an example, I'm five foot five and a half, don't forget the half, and I'm not really going to scare too many people if I threaten them with my fists, okay? Let's say I'm doing it against someone who's six foot six tall. If I went up to someone, raise my guns if you like, they are not going to be that scared of me. But should that excuse me from the offensive assault? And absolutely no, it should not. The victim, even if they are six foot six, is still going to predict, apprehend, expect unlawful personal violence from me to them, okay? They may not fear it, but they don't have to fear it. I would still be liable for the offence. So it's important to remember that. Don't talk about the defendant fearing immediate and unlawful personal violence. Talk about the victim apprehending immediate and unlawful personal violence against themselves. So they must, the victim must anticipate unlawful personal violence Case example for this, really interesting case, very unique circumstances, is the case of Lamb, 1967. Now in this case, two boys are messing about with a revolver. It was loaded with two bullets, but the two bullets were not lined with the barrel of the gun. A revolver has six chambers, two of the bullets were in two of the chambers, but it wasn't lined up, or the chambers weren't lined up, to be fired down the barrel of the gun. The two boys were obviously messing about with this gun and one of them fired the gun thinking that a bullet wouldn't come out of the barrel and yet it did because the revolver barrel, the chambers if you like, rolled round and indeed the bullet lined up with a barrel of the gun which fired the revolver and therefore one of the boys was actually hit with a bullet. But the victim did not anticipate that the bullet would be fired or the gun would be fired. They anticipated more laughing and joking. They didn't apprehend the use of immediate and lawful force against them because it was all just a joke. And on that basis, the defendant was found not guilty. They hadn't caused the victim to apprehend. The victim didn't expect or predict unlawful and immediate violence will be used against them, okay? So a rather unique case there, but um, hopefully that's clear enough, okay? Simply because they were joking around. Uh, moving on, again, another interesting case. Words can annul an assault. Real oldie of a case, Tuberville versus Savage, okay? It's hard to get your head around that statement. Words can annul an assault. So let me kind of explain this, although the case itself is really quite unique because it's so old, okay? So think of Tudor England in 1669, and we have something called assizes time, okay? Assizes are when judges are in town. So think of traveling courts, which used to travel around the country from A to B, hearing cases. Courts didn't necessarily have a permanent home in 1669, okay? So the defendant is picking a fight with the victim and the defendant pulls out his sword and actually utters the phrase, if it was not a sizes time, I would not take such language from you. So there's a bit of a threat there, which in ordinary circumstances would cause the victim to feel quite scared, okay? But interestingly, the defendant does accompany their action of drawing the sword with those words, if it was not a sizes time. And that translates effectively as, if the judges were not in town, 
I would then injure you. But the judges are in town, so therefore I'm just not going to draw my sword. I will take language like that from you, and therefore you're not going to come under any harm or be harmed by me. Okay, so a rather unique case there, but essentially the words uttered by the defendant basically nullify, negate, cancel out their actions. The action of drawing the sword would be threatening, but the words actually nullify and null the threat of the assault or null the assault itself, okay? So, really unique case there, and indeed a case worth remembering, it can occasionally appear in scenarios, obviously in a more modern day format. Now, moving on, the threat doesn't even have to be real. Case of Logden here, really simple case, and it was where the defendant, 1976, used an imitation firearm, okay? So the threat wasn't actually real towards the victim because the imitation firearm couldn't even fire any bullets, but the victim wasn't to know that, okay? And therefore the defendant was still liable for an assault. So the threat doesn't even have to be real if the victim is understandably fearful or understandably apprehends the use of immediate and lawful force, then that's enough for liability. Next key term then. So the next key term that we've got is immediate. And this question of immediacy is important, okay? So the use of unlawful force, we'll come to this phrase in a second, unlawful force, but the use of unlawful force must be imminent, okay? Doesn't have to be instantaneous, okay? Um, as an example, if I raise my fist, instantly someone is not going to get hurt. But there's not much of a time delay if I raise my fist and then throw a punch, okay? It, the use of the force just has to be imminent, okay? Close time proximity, if you like. Case example here, really useful and important case to remember. 1983, best year ever because I was born. Um, but the case of Smith, do cite it quite often in your scenarios, guys, okay? Because it's very relevant a lot of the times in the scenarios that you could get in an exam. So, circumstances of the case of Smith, the defendant broke into uh, the victim's garden and approached the window of their ground floor flat. And it was 11 o'clock at night and the victim got understandably scared by this to the extent that they apprehend the use of immediate unlawful force. However, how can you apprehend force against you when you have a window separating you and indeed the defendant. Doesn't quite make sense. So we've got this physical barrier, but the outcome of that case was, despite the physical barrier of the window, the defendant did actually cause the victim to apprehend the use of immediate and unlawful force. So the word immediate is inter open to interpretation. Um, I guess we could say if someone peers at you through a window, there is a sense of immediacy there. Having said that, if you're on a train and you're flying through a station and you do the action like that to someone on the platform, it is unlikely, and indeed I would say impossible, for you to jump off that train and actually carry out any violence towards that person, okay? So your action is relatively meaningless. It could be on a passing train, on a fast car, or indeed on a bus, okay? So how likely um, are you going to be able to actually commit uh, some sort of physical action against the victim in those circumstances, okay? But at least in the case of Smith, it was fairly likely, okay? Uh, and indeed, uh, the defendant was found guilty of an offence. Similar sort of principle there to Ireland and Burstow that the cases that we met earlier, the silent phone calls, where's a sense of immediacy with the defendant carrying out silent phone calls to a victim? Well, in that case, or in those cases, the defendant victim, sorry, the victim did not know where the defendant was. So if you get a phone call, that could be from someone in Australia, no sense of immediacy, but equally it could be someone 10 yards away, where there is a sense of immediacy. You're not to know, and indeed the victims didn't know in those cases where the defendant who was making those silent phone calls was, and therefore the sense of immediacy was there in theory, okay? And certainly that theory was enough for a conviction, okay? Next key term then, guys, we've got the term unlawful. Quite simple, guys. Um, you, uh, in threatening the use of force, have no legal justification for it, okay? So some people do have legal justification for the use of force. As an example, uh, the police, when arresting someone, someone may have consented for the use of force to be used against them or indeed you may use force or threaten to use force if you 
are employing some sort of defense, such as self-defense. You may feel that you have to use force, legal force, against someone because of the circumstances that you find yourselves in, okay? Um, so, it should be in lawful use of force, okay? Not recognized, if you like, or indeed endorsed by the law, okay? Um, next uh, key term, we're getting towards the end now, guys. Final actus reus is the use of personal violence. Personal violence is quite a strong term, and, you know, we often think of someone punching someone, kicking someone, hitting someone with a weapon, and yet personal violence can literally mean unwanted touching. That is it, okay? So, for example, if someone went up to you and you said, please don't touch me, and they did, then actually they've committed a battery against you. And that action of them threatening to touch you or leaning towards you to touch you, that would constitute an assault because you're apprehending the use of immediate and unlawful force or indeed personal violence. Not that violent, of course, but unwanted touching in its simplest and most basic form is enough. Men's ray elements then, guys. So there must be the intention to use uh, force against another person, immediate and unlawful force. Most of the time it is intentional, okay? Of course, if you threaten someone with immediate and unlawful personal violence, you probably intend to do it. But equally, you could do it recklessly. And the benchmark in terms of the level of mens rea is subjective recklessness. So in other words, you know there's a risk to your conduct, but you decide to take that risk anyway. So I know there's a risk, in raising my hand towards someone, but I decide to take that risk anyway, and I kind of appreciate that they may get a little bit worried that immediate unlawful force will be used against them. So, probably best not to raise your fists in a joking manner, because someone may not take it as a joke. It may be deemed to be subjectively reckless. Hope that's fairly clear for you guys. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you.